bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I worship Your
Good morning, church. Thank you for tuning in to our webcast again this week. I hope that it will be an encouragement and a blessing to you. Uh, I just want to make you aware that we are planning on still doing a uh, Halloween-type outreach at the end of the month. Um, it's going to be different with uh, trunk or treat usually being what it is. We're, we're needing to change that up a bit because of the uh, ongoing coronavirus situation. Uh, but we still want to be able to reach out to our community. So if you would like to still take part in that, maybe you've served for years at that event, or maybe you've been thinking that you'd like to do that this year, um, please talk to Pastor Scott about some of those details. And uh, as we continue to fine-tune things, we'll be sure to let you know that. Uh, if you are planning on coming by the church, over the next few days. We have some containers out in the front, so you can put your uh, donated candy in that, or you can drop it by the office, and we certainly would appreciate that help. Uh, that's a, it's a big need that we have. We had a great men's prayer breakfast yesterday, a good time of fellowship and time in prayer and in the Word together. And uh, men, I just want to encourage you to stay tuned. Uh, we'll have another one for sure. We'll probably be uh, trying to do that monthly, and we'd love to have you come out and be a part of that. Hope you have a fantastic week. As always, know that we're here for you. If you need uh, any of the pastors or deacons for anything at all, please don't hesitate to let us know. God bless.
so we're starting a brand new series today, Christian, what it really means. And I know many of you have been Christians, you've identified as that for many, many years. And for those of us who that's true of, we probably don't give too much thought to what's behind that name, to what's behind that, that banner that's over our lives. Uh, and I think we probably don't give too much thought to the fact that that word, just the word Christian, means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And maybe before you came to Christ, uh, it meant something entirely different than what it's come to mean for you as someone who is now a Christian. Or maybe you're here today and you don't identify as a Christian. You, you would say, well, no, I, I really don't consider myself that. I'm going to be honest, and you know, that's not really me. Um, I'm not there. And so maybe some of the reason that you're not there is because of what you think of when you hear that word Christian. Maybe that's been your exposure and your experience. It's been negative. Uh, And if that's not true of you, certainly that's true of people you know. Would you agree with that? Um, That there's there's a lot of people that you know and interact with uh, that the word Christian doesn't bring warm fuzzies uh, when when they hear that and when they think about it. Uh, To some people, the word Christian represents an arrogant, judgmental, morally inconsistent person. Um, For some, it means someone who is a generally good, ethical, and moral person. Uh, Someone maybe that goes to church a couple times a year, you know, on the major holidays. That's what some people uh, attach or understand uh, in terms of the word Christian or that that banner. Um, Then for some, it it means someone who is... um, a person that attends Mass, you know, and goes to confession, someone who accepts a person that wears a really strange hat called the Pope as the head of the church. That, that's the limit of some people's understanding or thinking of the word Christian or what it means to be uh, a Christian. Others would say, as my pastor growing up uh, frequently said, that the word Christian means People that don't drink, don't chew, and don't hang around those that do. He would say that all the time. Uh, And that's probably been some of your experience as well uh, in terms of what people say it means to be a Christian. Uh, That it's, it's all about not doing a huge list of things, and you don't usually hear of things that you should do. You don't hear of things to be for as much as you hear about things to be against, right? With me, I think we can all identify with that kind of approach uh, and that kind of consideration of what it means to be a Christian. And that's sad. That's sad. And it's that reason and other reasons um, that people just can't seem to embrace that word Christian and all that goes with it. Um, many non-Christians, and I know this from personal experience, and you probably do as well, many non-Christians base the main reason for not being a Christian on the fact that so many Christians who you know, bear that name and claim, yeah, I'm a Christian, it's that so many of them break their own rules. And that actually makes sense when you consider that many Christians, I don't, I'm not going to say all, but many Christians act like the main thing about being a Christian is keeping rules and regulations, which, by the way, no Christian will ever be able to do perfectly. will never happen. And yet, so many Christians, that's what they base the main thing about being a Christian around. Rules, regulations, standards, you know, making sure every single I is dotted the right way and every T is crossed the right way. And no one, no one, even the strongest, most sincere Christian can live up to this weight of crushing legalism that so many impose. None of us are going to be able to to perfectly walk out adherence to a, a big list or system of 
of rules and regulations. And please understand me, I am not saying that means that uh, we just ignore any type of pursuit of righteous or moral living. That's not what I'm saying at all. Um, we need to be marked by people that pursue righteousness and, and that are moral, and we need to be people of integrity. We need to be people of consistency. There are clear lines that we have to draw, uh, culturally speaking, and in terms of society, and separation is a very real thing. So I'm not saying anything to the contrary of that. What I am saying, though, is that this system of of rules and regulations and pursuing a moralism, that cannot be what drives us as Christians. That cannot be what defines us and what it means to be Christian. That's my point. That's not the secret sauce for what it means to be a Christian. Um, you know what I mean by secret sauce, right? That's, you know, all kinds of places have a secret sauce that sets the sandwich or the entree or whatever the restaurant has apart from the others. There's just something that distinguishes them. You know, uh, McDonald's, the Big Mac, has a secret sauce, which is not hard to find out in the day of, days of uh, Google and smartphones. You just look it up and see what it is, and you can make it yourself. But before that, it was really a secret sauce. And there's all kinds of other places that have the secret sauce that's their thing. And it goes beyond food. Uh, that's kind of become a euphemism for all sorts of things that uh, make uh, an organization or a company or a person unique and distinguished. You know, it, it kind of sets them apart, right? The secret sauce. The secret sauce, church, Christian, it, it cannot be about rule keeping only. It cannot be about uh, living up to self-imposed or man-manufactured regulations and standards. Uh, that cannot be the thing. That cannot be the bedrock or the foundation of our faith and living out that faith. That's, that's my point. And you know, when it comes to thinking about what it really means to be a Christian, there are times when I hear uh, what some people say the word Christian means, or I hear how some people would define it, what it means to be one. And many times I want to respond by quoting Inigo Montoya from The Princess Bride. Who has seen The Princess Bride, which is one of the greatest movies ever made? Who has seen that? Please say, okay, good, good. I'm glad I'm in some good company. The rest of you, here's some homework. Go home today and watch Princess Bride. When's the last time you heard that in church, huh? Yeah, well, in The Princess Bride, there's the character Inigo Montoya, and uh, his boss always says the word inconceivable, just like that, although, although better, okay? says it better. And he says that over and over, and Inigo Montoya says, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. He says that to, to, you know, over and over, inconceivable, inconceivable, everything's inconceivable. And so he just has enough. He says, you keep saying that, but do you even know what that word means? And so many times, that's how I want to respond, you know, to people. When I hear how they define what it means to be a Christian, I want to say, okay, you might be using that word for yourself. You might, you might tell people that's what you are, but you clearly don't understand what it is. Here, let's talk. Let's go through this. Let's understand what it really means. And so today and for the next couple of weeks, I want us to all really just maybe strip away preconceived notions and ideas that we've allowed to develop about what it means to be a Christian, maybe wrong ways of looking at it. And I want us just to kind of go back to the basics together and to be reminded of, according to God and His Word, what it really means to be a Christian and what it, what it doesn't mean. That's where we're going to be Lord willing, for the next couple weeks. And to get started on that, I want to turn our attention to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 11, and uh, specifically we're going to focus in on verse 19 and go through 26. So Acts 11, 19 through 26. Uh, if it doesn't mean the things that we, that I just shared and, and uh, suggested to you are, are common ways of looking at what it means to be a Christian, if that's not what it really means, then 
let's, let's look at, at God's Word and His truth to find out uh, what, it, what it should mean and to get a picture of that. And uh, starting with verse 19 of Acts 11, Word of God says this, Now those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen, which, by the way, uh, the Apostle Paul, who was Saul, had a big, big part to play in. Uh, he was there when Stephen, uh, the first official martyr of the church, was killed. He was holding the coats of those who actually stoned Stephen, and it gave him an idea as uh, a Pharisee of Pharisees, as he was before he came to Christ. He said, this is, this is something I can do. And so from that point on, he ushered in this sweeping persecution of the early church. And he went from city to city and town from town, and he rounded up all who at that time were called the way. And he went to, uh, to find out whoever they were, to stamp out this new movement, to haul them off to prison, to kick them out of the Sanhedrin. And in many cases, it even resulted in death for those who were believers. So Saul, who would become the Apostle Paul, was a direct party to that. And he was responsible for this huge persecution that took place, which, by the way, God actually used to cause his church to start fulfilling the Great Commission. That's what Jesus said before he left, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Yeah, I want you to focus on Jerusalem, but I want you to go into greater Judea and in Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, but they just stayed in Jerusalem. And so in his sovereignty, he allowed persecution to actually kick him out the door and to get him to go on and do what they were supposed to. So that's really the setting that we're in as we read this, okay? That's the backstory. So as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen, these believers made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Verse 20 says, But there were some of them, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Greeks also. So they expanded beyond just the Jews, and they reached out to the Gentiles, proclaiming the good news, which is the gospel. Proclaiming the gospel about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. News about them reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad and encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with devoted hearts. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and large numbers of people were added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul, who had been instrumental in bringing about the persecution of the church, but was now its greatest advocate, who was now a spokesperson for the way and for the Savior, the Lord Jesus. It's beautiful, just the, the story and reality of what happened in Paul's life. Uh, we, should never, we should never stop being amazed at that and what, what he could do in any life uh, if he did anything in Paul's life. Jesus, I'm saying, if, if Jesus could change Paul's heart, his mind, his life, you turn him around from a persecutor and make him a preacher, there is no limit to what he could do with anyone else. Amen? You agree with that? So he went to Tarsus to search for Saul, and verse 26 says, When he found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for a whole year they met with the church and taught large numbers. And here's, here's the key phrase that all of that leads up to and points to. The disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. They had not been called that before. They didn't even refer to themselves that way. This was really the starting point for the church, the believers in Christ, the followers of Christ, to be referred to as Christians. And Christian literally means of the party of Jesus. Of the party of Jesus. We're uh, right in the middle of the... Uh, a political season that we find ourselves in from time to time, and, and it's, always, uh, it's always an interesting time. It's always full of conflict and hostility and arguing. Um, 
we were driving into church, and, and the, uh, my kids pointed out all the signs. They said, man, look at all these political signs. What is it with all the political signs? And I said, tis the season. And, and uh, Addison said, tis the season for arguing. And she's, she's right. It is that, uh, unfortunately. Um, and we're all very familiar with what party someone belongs to, right? The Republican Party or the Democratic Party or uh, what is it, the Libertarian Party or the you name it, party. And so, you know, we understand that concept of kind of being aligned with a certain party or a movement or an organization, right? Well, Christian literally means of the party of Jesus. And we could break it down even more simply than that. And and it, it also means this. It fits within the literal meaning connotation. Jesus people. I love that. Isn't that great? Jesus people. That's what it literally means in its most simple form, uh, the word Christian. Uh, And an example of what this all means is that uh, in the first century and all the way through the third um, and and fourth even at the close of the Roman Empire, soldiers in Rome under particular generals in the Roman army uh, would identify themselves by their general's name, and they added I-A-N, Ian, to the end of that name. So, for example, uh, Caesar. Uh, people that were under Caesar would have called themselves a Caesarean. Okay? Um, so it identifies that, that I-A-N that represented that they were part of that, a specific group or under the banner of a certain leader, a certain person. And it was, it was clearly um, a way of saying, I am with them. I'm, I'm part of them. Okay? So to be a Christian means you have Jesus person as your first and greatest identity. That's what it means. It means that you are aligned with Jesus first and foremost above any other alignment. That you're identified as being with Him, tied to Him more than to anyone or any other thing. It's, it's the, the most distinguishing mark on your life. That's what it means. There's um, a story of of a person named Sanctus that was in um, the the early church uh, after the first century, Um, but Eusebius, who is a famous uh, early church historian, he he describes the story of Sanctus, who was a believer, follower of Christ, um, and he was tortured for Jesus. And as the people tortured him. They were trying to get him to say something evil or blasphemous and trying to get him to denounce Christ. And every time they would ask him questions and interrogate him, for example, they would ask his name, he would only reply, I am a Christian. And they would say, what nation do you belong to? And he would answer, I am a Christian. What city do you live in? I am a Christian. And his questioners started to get angry, and they would beat him just relentlessly. And they said, are you a slave or a free man? I am a Christian. That was his only reply. No matter what they asked, no matter how harshly they asked it, he only answered, I am a Christian. And no matter what they did to try to break him, no matter what they did to try to get him to denounce, he didn't. He wouldn't denounce his Savior. He died without denouncing his Savior, and with the the words, I am a Christian on his lips, he drew his last breath. That that would be true of us. That that would define us. That beyond any other affiliation, beyond any other banner, beyond any other mark that defines us, beyond any other thing we pursue, that I am a Christian would be the overarching, completely dominating banner over our lives. That's how it should be. That's how it should be. That's what it needs to be. To be a Christian is to experience a new reality. It's to reflect that reality to the rest of the world. It's to experience personally a brand new reality. And then it's to reflect that new reality out to the rest of the world 
that has yet to come into it. That's what it means to be a Christian. Christianity, church, Christian, Christianity is about resurrection over rules. It's about love over law. It's about unity over division. That's what Christianity is about. That's the secret sauce. Resurrection over rules. Love over law. Unity over division. And I I just need to qualify this a little bit again, okay? I am not saying that we don't pursue righteousness. I am not saying that rules aren't important at all or at any time. I'm not saying that it's not important to still be moral. I'm just saying that Christianity is not synonymous with moralism. Christianity is not synonymous with just rule-keeping. Christianity is not synonymous with legalism. We are not Christians because we are moral. We are moral because we are Christians. Do you get the difference there? That's an important distinguishing fact that many, many Christians get wrong and flip and get back and put backwards. Our moralism and our being people of integrity and our people being people that, that do follow the law and that respect rules and standards and guidelines that are over our lives and put in place around our lives, we don't do that um, to achieve Christianity and the experience of being a Christian. It's actually because we are a Christian that all those other things are important. We can't get it wrong. We can't get the order wrong, okay? And the resurrection of Jesus is absolutely the bedrock and foundation for our faith. That's how it was for the early church. That's what made the way later to be called Christians willing to face persecution, willing to face torture, willing to accept being thrown out of the Sanhedrin, willing to have family turn their back on them, willing to be ridiculed and mocked, and even willing to die. It wasn't because they were tied to a system of rules. It wasn't because they held up the law so highly. It wasn't because there was just this certain set of standards that they believed was absolutely the most important thing in their lives. No, the reason that the Christians, the early Christians, were willing to stand up against every sort of opposition and hostility, every sort of judgment, all the persecution that was thrown at them, the reason they were willing to take it all with joy is because they believed in a resurrected Savior. And that defined their entire lives. That's what launched everything. That's what Paul wrote about. That's what Peter preached about on the day of Pentecost that caused 3,000 people to come to Christ to become part of this new thing called Christianity. It wasn't about law. It wasn't about certain rules. It was about resurrection and the reality of it. And here's what the Word of God says about that about the fact that Christianity is, a, is resurrection over rules and love over law and unity over division. 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 20, the Apostle Paul writes this, if Christ has not been raised, if the resurrection's not real, if that's not reality, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. Those then who have fallen asleep in Christ, in other words, died as believers, died as believers in Christ, those then who have fallen asleep in Christ have also perished. If there's no resurrection of Christ, if that's not a reality, then those who believe in Jesus as Savior and believe that if they die in this life and when they die in this life and in this experience, if they believe in Christ, they will be with Him. And so Paul here is saying, if there's no such thing as the resurrection of Christ, if that's not a reality, then all those who died believing in him didn't live after death. They just perished, and that was it. Verse 19, if we, this is so huge, this is the bedrock of what it means to be a Christian, Christian, if we have put our hope in Christ for this 
life only. We should be pitied more than anyone because we were duped more than anyone if there's no such thing as the resurrection of Christ and by extension, no such thing as the resurrection of those who are in Christ. Thankfully, though, that's not something we have to worry about. Because look at what verse 20 says. But as it is, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Christ has been risen, has been raised, he is risen from the dead, and he goes before, goes ahead of all those who are in him, who believe in him, that will also rise from the dead to eternal, incorruptible life, all because he did first. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's resurrection over rules. John 13, 34 through 35, Jesus himself, as he's winding down his time with the disciples and winding down his earthly ministry, getting ready to go to the cross, he said this to his early disciples, and it's absolutely relevant and applicable to us, his modern day, current disciples. John 13, 34 through 35, Jesus says this, I give you a new command. I give you a new command. You know about the Ten Commandments. You know about the law. You know about all that. Listen, I, I want you to have a new command, and, and it's, just, it's just one. Here's one command I'm giving you, Jesus is saying. Love one another. Love one another. Just as I have loved you, Jesus said, you are also to love one another. You've received my love, you've benefited from my love, you know you have my love, now reciprocate that. Love one another with the same kind of love you've received from me, Jesus is saying. And then he, he qualifies it. Verse 35, by this, by this thing, by this commandment, by this principle, by this way of life, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's the measurement. That's the standard. That's what defines a true, a genuine disciple of Christ from one who is just pretending, from one who is an artificial one. Love for one another. Love, not law. Jesus didn't say, I want you to make sure that you memorize and live out perfectly every single one, every jot, every tittle from the law. That's not what he said. He didn't say, that's how everybody's going to know you're different. That's going to be the secret sauce for you, my followers, that you just absolutely hold up the law as supreme and abide by it with every fiber of your being. You better be perfect at it because that's how the world's going to know that I'm real and that you're really part of me. That's not what he said. He said, the world's going to know that you're my disciples. The world's going to know that I'm real by how you love. And if you love one another, that's what's going to speak volumes to the world around you. Love over law. Galatians 5, 6 says this, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision, which is a way of really kind of summarizing and capturing the law, the Old Testament, the Mosaic law, in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision accomplishes anything. What matters is faith working through love. That's what matters. That's, that's the secret sauce. Faith in Christ working out through love for one another. That's what should define the disciple of Christ. And then, as I said, Christianity is also about unity over division. Here's also Christ's words, John 17, his true high priestly prayer where he interceded for his uh, immediate disciples there around him, but also all future disciples, that's you and me. He prayed for us before he went to the cross to die for us. John 17, 20 through 23, Jesus says this, I pray not only for these, these 
disciples right around me, Peter and James and John and and the others, I, I pray not only for these, but also for those who believe in me through their word, which was passed down through the centuries all the way up to today, which you, at some point in your life, if you're a Christian, you were told, you were taught, you were preached this word, this message, this gospel that the disciples were the first preachers of, and you believed God gave you the faith to accept and receive what you heard. He gave you faith unto salvation, and it's a direct result of what was started in the first century. And Jesus, before he went to the cross, prayed for people like you and me. It's astounding. I pray also for those who believe in me through their word. Listen to this. May they all be, and you tell me, you finish it, one as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, may they all, uh, excuse me, also be in us, and here's that, that reason, so that the world may believe you sent me. I have given them the glory you have given me, so that they may be, what is it? One, as we are one. I am in them, and you are in me, so that... You see a pattern here? So that they may be made completely one, that the world outside of them may know you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. Love. Love. Faith working through love. It's resurrection over rules. It's love over law. It's unity over division. And the Antioch Christians, the the church at Antioch where the way and the believers in Christ were first called Christians, they believed that in Christ and because of his resurrection that death is defeated. And that, that they believed is what should drive the Christian's devotion to Christ and love for him above any other thing. They believe that the resurrection of their Savior is what should drive and define our devotion to our Savior and our love for Him. Not a system, not a a, a list of rules that we absolutely have to keep or else. Not that rules should just be thrown out. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that they never supersede the importance of resurrection. They believed that in Christ and through Him, Real unity is possible and more powerful than even the strongest difference. You know, we, we come from different backgrounds. We, we come from different perspectives. We have different ways of looking at things. I guarantee you, you take any two of us and you put us side by side, and it's not going to take long before you see that the two people are looking at things differently. But what the early church and the Antioch church believed is that in Christ and through Him, real unity is a possible reality and that it's more powerful than anything else that divides. We need to believe that too, church. Faith Baptist, 2020 Christians, we need to believe that too. And if we really believe it, if we really believe what they believed, then we will live it. We will live it. Because lifestyle always proves belief or lack of it. We always will be able to know what we really believe ourselves personally and others in how we live and how we act and what we apply. So I want to leave you with some good questions to consider, some good questions to ponder and think about. These are really important questions as we consider all that we just talked about, what it means to be a Christian. As as we saw from the early church here in Acts, as we heard from Jesus himself, are we, and make it personal, am I, living up to the name we claim? Are we living up to the name we claim? Am I living up or living out the name I claim, if I say I'm a Christian, if that's the banner over my life, am I really living out what it truly means to be one? 
Another question, a good question to ask. Are we smashing the world's stereotypes? Are we smashing the world's stereotypes? Or are we proving them to be right? You know, there's a lot of stereotypes, a lot of assumptions that the world has about Christians, and in no way am I saying that they are all accurate or all deserved. I'm not saying that. But what are we doing to prove them wrong? What are we doing to prove people wrong about Christians only being judgmental and hostile and critical, hypercritical, and always talking about what's wrong, not ever about what's right, always being uh, what we're uh, against, not hearing about what we're for. What are we doing to smash those stereotypes? Are we letting down the drawbridge of our castle? Are we draining the moat? Or are we keeping ourselves holed in in this impenetrable fortress? Last question I want to leave you with. It's a good question for all of us to constantly ask. Are we experiencing and reflecting the new reality that only Christ makes possible? Some good questions to ask. Are we experiencing and reflecting the new new reality that only Christ makes possible? Are we smashing the world's stereotypes? And are we living up to the name we claim? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your work. I thank you that in Jesus and only in him we can know what freedom really is. And that doesn't mean we use the freedom we have to just go out and live however we want. That doesn't mean that we we don't hate sin and reject sin in all forms. It doesn't mean we say, oh, we can just sin because grace is going to abound. We need to say, like Paul did in Romans, no, no, may God forbid. That's not how it works. Freedom in Christ is not freedom to sin. Freedom in Christ is freedom to not sin and to pursue righteousness. But Father, it also means that rules and standards and regulations That's not what drives or defines us. It's the resurrection of your Son. Thank you that we're not under the law and under its crushing weight, impossible to keep. We're under love, and and we're to live out and work out faith through love. Thank you that in your Son, and as we are reminded of in your Word, unity really is possible. And it's It's more powerful. Unity in Christ is more powerful than any human division. Father, help us to believe that. And more importantly than just simply believing, help us please to live this out, to reflect this new reality, the reality that changed everything in the Roman Empire in the first century and the second and the third and really every century after it, the reality of Christ and what it means to be a Christian, it changed everything, and it can still change everything. Help us to be people who live it out, I pray, all by the power of your indwelling Spirit. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.
my treasures will mean nothing. Only what I've done for love's reward will stand the test of It's all been said and done There is just one thing